students welcome to this UGC series of lectures today I am going to deliberate upon botany cultivation and economic importance of rice as we know rice is one of the major food crops of the world it's a staple food for more than one and a half of the world's population India is the largest rice growing country coming to the botanical name botanical name of rice is oryza sativa rice belongs to the family poesi the basic chromosome number of the genus is 12 two cultivated species of rice include oryza sativa and oryza glabrima oryza sativa is cultivated throughout the warmer regions of the world whereas the cultivation of oryza glabrima is confined to tropical Africa. Oryza sativa has evolved from its wild perennial relative Oryza rufipogon, while as Oryza glabrima has evolved from Oryza longestaminata. Now, I will discuss the morphology of rice plant. The rice plant is a semi-aquatic, free tilling annual grass with a cylindrical jointed stem. The internodes are shortest at the base and become progressively longer. Generally, rice has a shallow root system. Seedling characters. The grains of rice that lack dormancy germinate immediately upon ripening. First, coleoriza comes out. After this, the radical breaks through the coleoriza. This is followed by two or more spinal roots, all of which develop lateral roots. Vegetative characters. The roots are fibrous, having rootlets and root hairs. The leaves arise in a two ranked arrangement on the culm, and one leaf is present at each node. The uppermost leaf below the panicle is called the flag leaf. There are two air like appendages born on either side of the base of a leaf called auricles. A membranous structure known as ligule is present at the junction of the blade and sheath. The junction of the sheath and blade is known as collar. Floral characters. The rice inflorescence is a loose terminal panicle. The spikelet is the unit of inflorescence. The spikelets are one flower. It has a self-pollinated flower. The spikelet consists of a minute axis on which a single floret is born in the axils of two ranked bracts. The bracts of lower pair are called sterile glooms or empty glooms. The upper bracts or the flowering or fertile glooms are known as lemma and palea. At the base of lemma and palea are a pair of colorless and transparent lodicules. Lodicules aid in the opening of the spikelet. At anthesis, the lodicules become turgid and thrust lemma and palea apart, exposing the fertile stamens. The lemma and palea may or may not possess awns. The presence or absence of awn is a hereditary character. The presence of awn in rice is advantageous as it is less subjected to bird attacks. The lemma and palea together are known as hull. The rice grain with the hull is known as paddy or rough rice, whereas the one in which the hull is removed is known as brown or husked or cleansed rice. There are six fertile stamens in two rows of three each. Anthers are versatile. Coming to ori, ori is hypogynous, monocarpillary, unilocular, with a single basal ovule and a pair of feathery stigmas at the top. The embryo contains the embryonic leaves known as plumule and the embryonic primary root called radical. The plumule is enclosed by the coleoptiles and the radical by coleoriza. These form the embryonic axis which is bounded by scutellum lying next to endosperm. The endosperm is enclosed by the eluron layer lying beneath the tegmen. The white starchy endosperm consists of star granules which are embedded in a proteinaceous matrix. After morphology, I will discuss the cultivation of rice. First, we will know 
the climatic and the soil requirements which is needed for cultivation of rice. Rice can be grown on many types of soils but heavy alluvial soils of river valleys are preferable. The crop has a preference for acidic soils. Rice is a crop of swampy soils where the land remains submerged under water for 60 to 90 days during the growing season. There are two varieties of rice which include upland varieties and the lowland varieties. Upland varieties need a minimum of 60 to 120 cm of rainfall whereas the lowland types demand 180 to 240 cm of rainfall. The rice crop thrives best under the conditions of high temperature and humidity. The average temperature during growing phase ranges between 21 and 35 degrees Celsius. Sowing of grain. The first step in ensuring the quality production of rice is to choose an appropriate good grain. Good seed should be pure, uniform in size, viable and free of weed seeds, seed borne diseases and pathogens. Now sowing of seed. It is done by the three methods which include broadcasting, dibbling and drilling. First of all broadcasting method. In this the seeds are spread on the soil surface without any specific pattern. And in dibbling a spot is opened up in the soil and 5 to 8 seeds are sown at a depth of 2 to 3 cm. The yields are high in this method. In drilling a small groove is made in the soil. The seeds are sparsely sown in the groove and then the groove is covered with soil. Now cultural practices of rice cultivation. The cultural practices of rice cultivation include first dry paddy cultivation in which the crop is raised on dry ground like other cereals and second one is wet paddy cultivation wherein the crop is grown under an adequate supply of water. Fertilizer requirements. Before the flooding and planting of rice seedlings, fields are fertilized with either farmyard manure or compost. Rice, it responds extremely well to the nitrogenous and phosphate fertilizers. Rice is the crop that takes ammonia as a source of nitrogen. In dry paddy cultivation, the seeds may be sown directly either by broadcasting, drilling or dibbling, whereas in wet paddy cultivation, the seeds are generally sown first in a small nursery and later the seedlings are transplanted into flooded field. Transplanting The 20 to 28 days old seedlings are ready for transplantation. 3 to 4 seedlings are pushed into a mud mound by hand and are usually planted in regular lines. Weeding Weeding of rice is usually done by hands but there are many mechanical devices like the rotary weeder. Nowadays also different herbicides are used for the eradication of these weeds. For example, nitrogen at the rate of 2.4 kg per hectare is used for controlling a variety of grasses. Malinate and tropanil are effective post-emergence herbicides. 2,4-D, MCPH245T and Silvex, they are used in rice for controlling the broadleaf weeds and nut sedge. After this, harvesting. The right stage for harvesting paddy is when the panicles are turned down and they are yellowish in color. Harvesting of rice crop is usually done with hand sickles but mechanical means are also followed. Following cutting, the rice is threshed to separate the grain from the stalk. The grains, they are then winnowed so that to make them free of dust, chaff, short pieces of straw, lighter grains by tossing it into the air above a sheet or a mat. Post harvest processing. After harvesting, the rice grain undergoes a number of processes. They are drying. It is the process that reduces the grain moisture content to a safe level for storage. Number second is storing that is done so as to reduce the grain loss due to weather, moisture, rodents, birds, insects and microorganisms. The last and the final step in the post harvest processing is milling. It's a crucial step in the post-production of rice. The basic objective of a rice milling system is to remove husk and bran layers so as to produce an edible white rice kernel that is free of impurities. 
The husk is removed either by hand powering or by power driven machines. The former method consists of pounding the rice using a pestle and mortar and it also gives a higher recovery of rice than machine milling. In modern methods, the rough rice is first fanned and screened so as to remove any extra matter such as small lumps of soil, stones, stalks, dirt and twine. A rice milling system can be a simple one or two step process or a multi-stage process. In a one step milling process, husk and bran are removed in one pass and the milled or white rice is produced directly out of paddy. In a two step process, husk and bran are removed separately and the brown rice is produced as an intermediate product. In multi-stage milling, rice undergoes a number of different processing steps. To improve the sheen and keeping the quality of white rice, it is often slightly oiled and glazed with talc, glucose or some other material. The milled rice is then graded and bagged. After discussing the cultivation path, I will deliberate upon a new method of cultivation of rice that is system of rice intensification or you can abbreviate it as SRI. SRI is considered to be a technological breakthrough in the paddy cultivation. It involves the application of certain management practices which together provide the better growing conditions for rice plants. This system seems to be a promising in overcoming the shortage of water in irrigated rice. The key physiological principle behind the SRI is to provide optimal growing conditions to individual rice plants. Tilling is maximized and the phyllocrones are shortened which is believed to accelerate the growth rates. Furthermore, intermittent irrigation is believed to improve the oxygen supply to rice roots thereby decreasing air and chyma formation. This causes a stronger, healthier root system with a potential advantage for nutrient uptake. Proponents of SRI claim that its use increases yield, saves water and it reduces the production costs. That's all about SRI. Environmental Impacts Rice cultivation on wetland rice fields is thought to be responsible for 6-29% of the anthropogenic methane emissions annually. Rice requires slightly more water to produce than other grains. Long-term flooding of rice fields cuts the soil off from atmospheric oxygen and causes anaerobic fermentation of organic matter in the soil. Current contributions of methane from agriculture is approximately 15% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gases as estimated by the IPCC. Methane is 20 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. A 2010 study found that as a result of rising temperatures and decreasing solar radiation during the later years of the 20th century, the rice yield growth rate has decreased in many parts of Asia compared to what would have been observed had the temperature and the solar radiation trends not occurred. Now coming to rice breeding, there are different thousand varieties of Oryza sativa. They occur in different geographical regions of the world. Breeders have been engaged in breeding the new varieties of rice for improving grain quality, yield and resistance to diseases and pests. International Rice Research Institute was established in Los Banos, Philippines with the aim of breeding high yielding varieties of tropical rice. The famous semidorf variety IR8 that was obtained as a result of cross between the tall tropical variety Pita and the subtropical semidorf Digio Vujin. This variety has several desirable characteristics like its 100 cm tall, erect, profusely tilling and early maturing plant. It has stiff culms, dark green leaves and high ratio of green to straw. It has high response to nitrogen and no response to photoperiod. High yielding varieties of rice. Some of the high yielding varieties of rice include Bala, Kaveri, Jamna, Kanji, Krishna, Sabarmati, Ratna, Padma, Jaya, IR8, IR20, Vijaya, Pankaj and Jagannath. Due to the Mediterranean climatic conditions prevalent in Kashmir, distinct varieties labeled as K varieties have been developed. Some varieties include K59, K74, K81, K84, 
K332, K333, K13, K59 is among the one of the best varieties. Golden Rice Rice kernels do not contain vitamin A. Thus, people who obtain most of their calories from rice are at the risk of vitamin A deficiency. To overcome this deficiency, researchers have genetically engineered rice to produce beta-carotene which is the precursor of vitamin A in the rice kernel. The beta-carotene turns the processed white rice a gold color, hence the name golden rice. The beta-carotene is converted to vitamin A in humans who consume the rice. Parboiled rice. Parboiling is an ancient method of processing paddy which originated in India and is widely followed. About one fifth of the world's rice crop is parboiled. The process of parboiling includes four different stages which are soaking, steaming, drying and milling. It's first soaked in water for one or two days so that grain absorbs water. In the prolonged soaking, the water may have to be changed several times as to prevent the bacterial infection. After soaking, the paddy is steamed at atmospheric pressure for 30 minutes or less. Through the use of steam pipes or heating in a limited amount of water in a vessel. During steaming, thymine and the other water soluble nutrients originally present in the germ and eludon layer diffuse through the grain which is an advantage over the milled rice. After steaming, the paddy must be dried in direct sunlight. Drying should be done carefully, that is not very fast nor very slow. Parboiled rice after being dried is pounded or milled in the same way as raw rice. Parboiling toughens the grain and reduces the percentage of breakage during milling. It is alleged that adult beriberi is much less common in the population consuming parboiled rice than those consuming raw rice. Rice conversion It's a general experience that rice eaters tend to prefer milled rice to undermilled or home pounded rice. Similarly, the substitution of raw rice by parboiled rice presents serious difficulties due to its appearance and different taste. Rice conversion is essentially parboiling technically perfected, modernized and protected patents. The process is essentially similar to parboiling with the standardization in the technique which yields an attractive highly milled product with nutritive properties similar to parboiled rice. Now I will discuss the economic importance of rice. First as we all know that rice is a staple food in many parts of the world. It's consumed more than any other grain. A diet of rice and soya beans constitutes the food of millions of Asiatic natives. Second, parboiled rice. Parboiled rice is prepared for making marmura. It's prepared by heating to a high temperature in an iron pan which is containing sand. Little rice is thrown into the heated sand and stirred rapidly until the rice cracks and swells. Flaked rice. Flaked rice is thin, papery and off-white in color. It's eaten with the suitable flavoring agents and forms a good breakfast food like corn flakes. Sake It's an important alcoholic beverage that is used by Japanese. The raw materials used in sake brewing are rice and water. Bran is an another important byproduct of the rice milling industry and it is used as cattle feed. Chemically, it contains moisture, fat, protein, fiber, ash, small amounts of sucrose, reducing sugars, thymine and nicotinic acid. Its proteins are superior to those of rice kernel. Bran oil is extracted immediately after milling the rice, otherwise it deteriorates rapidly. It's used as an edible oil and has better qualities for storage because it contains antioxidants like alpha and gamma tocopherols. It's also used in textile industry, leather industry, flexible film industry and enamels. Coming to bran wax, bran wax is used in chocolate industry, coating for candy, preparation of wax emulsions applied to fruits and vegetables and cosmetic like lipsticks. Husk, rice husk is used as a fuel 
mainly in rural areas. It's used in brick kilns, in house building, compost making and brick making. Rice husks is variously used as soil conditioner, bedding material for animals and poultry and also for animal feed. Straw Rice straw is used for feeding cattle. It's used in thatching, making hats, mats, ropes and baskets. Coming to the medicinal use of rice, the roots and grains of rice are also of the medicinal value. The roots are cooling, diuretic and febrifuge and are useful in burning sensation, fever and diabetes. The grains are sweet, acrid, aphrodisic, diuretic, carminative and tonic. So, I conclude today's lecture with these marks that rice which is an annual grass is a staple food for a large number of populations and India is the major rice producing country. Rice prefers acidic soils and grows best under water lodging conditions and at the temperatures ranging from 21 to 35 degrees Celsius. I hope you might have understood it. See you next time. Thank you.